Hi, uh, my name is Dr. Raja Adnan Ahmed and I'm a consultant psychiatrist working in UK and with me uh, this afternoon is uh, Dr. Aman Arora from Arora Medical Education. A lot of you will already know uh, Dr. Arora. Um, he's uh, very active on social media and he's helped a lot of IMGs uh, achieving different goals including FLAB and GP training. Uh, so I thought it would be a good idea to invite Dr. Uh, Aman Arora to talk about what is general practice and uh, you know how do how does one get into general practice? So Aman, th first of all, thank you very much for joining me this afternoon. Uh, thank you so much, Raja. It's great, great to do this. Great to do this with you. Uh, a lot of IMGs are very interested in general practice, and you know, and they hear a lot of good things about it, and sometimes they hear some bad things about it as well. But this is something you know they always ask me about: what is general practice, and you know, what does it really involve? Because you know. The concepts are quite different. If you're coming from, for example, India or Pakistan, the whole concept of general practice, the whole concept of training and uh, exams is, is not there. So, so if you have to explain in sort of in a summary, you know, what is general practice in UK and you know, what is it like? Yeah, I think a great question to start with. I mean, one of the common questions I get is, what is this GP thing? And everybody seems to be doing GP and talking about GP and you know. Why do so many people go into general practice? General practice is the, 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 the core or the bedrock of the NHS, I suppose, in the UK, the primary care system, you could, you could say. It's, it's where the majority of consultations happen between doctor and patient in the UK. It's almost a gateway to services in secondary care or hospital. So a GP, I, I, I put it as a, similar to a consultant in, in family medicine, basically. That's how I'd, I'd look at it. Um, it's got a lot of differences from hospital consultant work, but it's got a lot of similarities in that you're a doctor and seeing patients. So there's a huge spread as to general practice, what it means for different people. There are many types of GP. You can form your own pathway in general practice. And these are some of the pros that people end up coming into GP for. But as you said, there's a lot of um, stuff I see it on social media all the time, like the, the, the negative general practice and some misconceptions. So hopefully we can clear up some of those as we go through today. So some of the advantages people talk about is that the training is shorter than uh, uh, other, other specialty training. So it's only three years training once you enter the training. Uh, then they also talk about the, some flexibility as well, that as a GP, you know, the, you have more control on your time. Uh, you know, a lot of GPs are not doing night shifts or uh, out of hour, unsocial hours. This is something a lot of people find very attractive that, you know, you can, you can be in that uh, stage quite early in your career. Uh, because to become a consultant in, in sometimes other specialties, you have to have so many years of training and you still be doing nights, you know, six, right. seven years in time. Um, so mm. when you, when people mention some, some sort of things they, they find not so useful about GP, what sort of, what sort of things they have mentioned to you? Um, can I just pick, talk about those two flexibility points that you mentioned? They're very, very important. The, the two big pros, because you're right, two of the reasons that people go into general practice are number one, the training length, as you said. That currently is three years. It's going to change at some point because the three-year model doesn't really suit current needs as a GP. So three years, I don't think is enough to, 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 to be sustainable for many more years going forward. So it, currently it's three years, yes. Um, but there's talks of four years and, and possibly five years going forward. And I think at some point that was happening. The three-year model was based on the 70s and 80s. That's you know when it used to be that three years seemed sufficient to have GP training, now it's out of date. So I think three years will, will extend going forward, but it won't reach the seven, eight years, like you say, that it takes to, to, to get to other specialty levels. Flexibility is a huge thing, and, and flexibility, it, it comes down to choice. When, you, when you're a GP, there is so much choice that you have in the way that you run your career. Do you want it to be work-life balance career? Do you want it to be a life-work balance career? Do you want to be working three days, four days, five days? And if it's five days, do you want it to be five days clinical or, or have some other interest that you can develop, whether it's being a gypsy or a, a GP with a special interest or in something else like education or leadership. So flexibility is one thing in terms of determining how much you work and how many days and hours and whether you want to do out of hours or not. Some GPs do do night shifts and they do do weekends because they choose to do that. They want to be a GP who just works on weekends, for example. That choice is something that attracts a lot of people and it's a very strong draw to general practice. But then you get a lot of GPs who have the choice to move and do something else, but they, they, they want to just do their 10 sessions a week, clinical general practice, they might even do a Saturday out of hours. So, it's, so the flexibility is there, the choice is there, but, but that doesn't mean that you have to be doing lots of other things and, and you can still have a normal clinical 
life as a GP. And I think that's really important to mention as well. Um, and if we talk about a recruitment, you know, there's a, a, obviously a lot of IMGs will ask, you know, how do we, if you're thinking about becoming a GP, you know, where do, where should we start from? You know, what is the criteria to apply for GP training and what is the recruitment process like? Um, I understand, you know, I mean, we are recording this interview uh, in August uh, 2020 and we are still going through the pandemic. So things are not yeah. working normally as they, as they were. So yes. this recruitment round may be slightly, you know, the change format. But um, if you run yeah. us through some of the requirements and then. Sure. So, so I, I suppose in terms of the eligibility criteria is similar or it has got a lot of crossovers with other specialties because you're applying from a position of being an F2 doctor. So whether you're applying for a psychiatry or dental practice, there's a lot of crossover in terms of things like having your basic medical qualification, having your full GMC registration, license to practice by the time you start that rotation, um, crest forms, I'm sure you've talked about in a little bit of other videos. Um, so the eligibility criteria doesn't change too much from some of the other specialties. You have to be in a certain position to be able to apply for specialty training, whether it's GP or, or other things. So there's not too many differences from GP to others in that instance. The recruitment process itself is, is very different. It's unique to general practice and most specialties, as you know, have their own pathway. So for GP training, if we talk about normal GP recruitment, so out of the, the COVID scene, there are generally three stages and, th and this might change after COVID as well. It, it, it is, you know, whether we see all three stages come back when they're available, we're not sure, but at the moment there are three stages. Stage one, which is called long, list, uh, long uh, listing, Stage two, which is the MSRA assessment that many of your watchers will be familiar with. And stage three um, is called GP stage three entry. So the long listing is essentially your application form uh, where your eligibility is checked off, whether you've got all the requirements to be able to apply for GP training in the first place. So a lot of people want to apply for GP training and they realize when they get to that stage one that actually I haven't got this in place, I haven't got this in place. And there's a lot of jumping around to try and get certain things ticked off. Stage two or step two is your MSRA assessment, which is similar to, well, it's the same assessment that's taken by multiple specialties. So that's, a, as you know, an MCQ format exam, two papers, one clinical based and one based on professional dilemmas, so situational judgment tests. Um, and then stage three and, and certain percentages of people can bypass the next stage if you get a high enough score. Um, but then if you're successful in stage two and you haven't got into that small cohort that directly gets an offer, then you move into your stage three assessment, which is a face-to-face -face assessment uh, based on simulations and um, a prioritization exercise, which you do as a half day assessment in a center. So those are your general three stages that were happening pre-COVID and probably will happen again post-COVID. But obviously during the COVID process, there's been a lot of um, innovation in terms of things like recruitment. So we may find that, that the procedure process is different when we come back out of it as well. Uh, and if somebody is thinking about uh, going into GP training, you know, how much time will they sort of, they should have to sort of get ready for all these stages? Like for, for example, the MSRA exam and the stage three, you know, <clears throat> what should they be doing to sort of improve themselves so they are ready? Yeah, I mean, really good question. And I think we'll start with MSRA because it's, it's a different type of exam to stage three. With MSRA, I think it depends a lot on a, a few things. Number one, your style of preparation. Are you somebody who likes to go from the beginning and go through every piece of information and it takes time to understand it? Or are you someone who tends to, to do it all in a very quick period of time once the pressure builds because the exam's going away? So obviously people spend three weeks preparing for SRA and get a really good score and I've seen people prepare for 12 months and still struggle. So like any assessment, I think the first thing about SRA is understanding what the two papers are, what are the kind of things that are being assessed of me, understanding the, the competencies that are going to be tested. And then if you base your preparation around that, then the number of hours that you need to put in can come down significantly because you're walking more smartly, more efficiently. So rather than it being a, a time scale, on, on average, I'd say three to six months is what I see people do in terms of preparation for SRA. But that doesn't mean that it necessarily needs three to six months. You know, I've seen people do it within a month. And, and that's where going the other way and understanding what's being looked at, you can save you a lot of time. Um, and there are two main ways that people prepare. There's, there's question banks, and, and that's important because you need to constantly have your brain problem solving, both from a clinical point of view and from an, an SJT point of view, which is where a lot of people struggle. 
but a lot of people rely on just doing question after question after question after question after question and you can take you know 12 months doing questions non-stop do every question out there but if your technique is not right if you're not picking up things that you're doing constantly that's um, wrong in your technique then doing it for longer and doing more questions is not going to help you so the other side of sra preparation is is getting your background knowledge up to scratch but also looking at technique areas and how are you answering certain questions and when you put the two together the time frame doesn't have to be as long as some people suggest and for the stage three is there anything out there to they should be doing so stage three is is uh, is slightly different and most people will practice through role plays because you have three simulations um you have to simulate yourself talking to a patient you have a second simulation where you're talking to a relative of a patient and you have a third simulation where you're talking to a colleague. So there's a lot of material out there in terms of the types of scenarios that people practice and role play amongst groups. Um, but again, it's a lot about understanding what's being looked at from the other side. And once you look at the, the, all the documentation that the GPNRO or the GP National Recruitment Office have for both stage two and stage three, then you can start to understand what is going to be assessed of me and then you can prepare a little bit better. But in general, stage two, people prepare on their own. Um, doing questions and background reading and stage three generally people practice in groups because it takes a little bit more role play um, and preparation from that point of view. And I, uh, here I just wanted to mention that uh, I'm going to mention about SRA exam. A lot of people who apply for GP, they also apply for other specialties like psychiatry. So if you're applying on the same round, you know, you, this is the same exam you take SRA and the, you don't have to take it uh, uh, you know, multiple times for the, for the same round, you know, you, your score could be counted for yeah. different specialties. This is one advantage. Yeah, it's a great um, point. A great point. And the other thing to mention about the other specialties is that the way that they use the MSA result is different, isn't it, in every specialty? Yeah. So in general practice, for example, currently, everything is all, all on MSRA for the current round. So we're in currently round two for a February start. And everything to do with GP entry in this round is based on MSRA. There's no GP stage three, for example. Whereas normally what happens in GP recruitment is that your MSRA score counts for 60% of your overall score and your stage three part counts for 40%. Whereas in something like psychiatry, radiology, et cetera, where you're still doing the same assessment, how they look or use MSRA might be slightly different, I guess. Yeah, that's great. Uh, the other thing I mean, you do a lot is helping people with their, their MRC GP exam. Uh, and a lot of IMDs again ask, uh, you know, when they are thinking about GP, they always think, how difficult is the exam? Is that, is that something they will be able to pass? How many parts are there in, in uh, MRC GP? Uh, so what is your experience of that yeah. in, in helping IMDs in that? Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the main bulk of help that we give is for two things. MRC GP, so when they're in GP training, we try and help people come out the other side. And then going back a step to try and get them into GP training as well. But now, yes, MRCGP is their top exams. You know, AKT is your first, so you have part one and part two, if you like. AKT is your part one, your MCQ based exam. This you can only do from your second year of training onwards. And then you have your part two or your CSA exam, your clinical skills assessment, which is the one that you can't do until ST3. Currently, it's replaced by something called RCA because of the COVID situation. but the, the, the RCGP is saying that once COVID finishes, we'll go back to the CSA model. So anyone thinking about applying now is going to be looking at CSA by the time they come around, unless things change. So both of these assessments are very tough. Um, they take, and I see people fail, and I see people take them several times before they get through. But like with any assessment, Raja, as you know, again, it's about understanding what is this assessment looking from you. So for example, an, an AKT exam is not just looking at knowledge. They kind of maybe expect now by this point, you have knowledge, you're a GPSD2 trainee. It's not testing, do you know the four causes of left heart failure? They kind of expect that. This is the applied part of it now. So, okay, you're seeing a patient in practice. Um, you know that this potentially could be heart failure because of the symptoms they're coming to see you with. How can you apply that to a decision that you need to make right now with limited time with limited availability of results. It's that kind of assessment. So until you understand that that's, that's the framework that I need to be thinking of, then you can do loads of work, but still struggle in passing an exam like this. So are they possible? Yes. Are they challenging? Yes. You are, you are doing exams to, to, to become a member of a Royal College. So they are going to be challenging, but it doesn't mean that if you, if you've cleared your recruitment assessment, you should be able to have the skills to pass MRCGP. But, 
in quick answer to the question, there are three components to MRCGP, and it's, it's one of the, the odd MRCGP qualifications that you, you can't finish training without completing MRCGP. In other specialties, if you take you know, your MRC exams and you don't clear them, it doesn't mean you can't, you can, you, it doesn't mean you can stop work. Say you do MRCS, for example, and you don't clear your MRCS exams. Okay, it might mean you can't get past a certain point in training, but it, it still means you can still work as an SHO, for example, in, in, in a surgical ward. Whereas in GP training, if you don't pass MRC GP, you cannot work in general practice the way the current thing stands. So it's a lot of pressure to get through those three those components. I think that's right. I was going to mention the same thing in psychiatry is the same. If you don't, if you've done your core training and you haven't passed your MRC psych, you have other options. You can go down the route of Caesar. You can start working as a, uh, as a staff grade or a specialty doctor. But that yeah. doesn't, uh, does the post of a middle grade or a specialty doctor doesn't exist in GP line, you know, that's unfortunate. Yes. Um, at the moment, Raj, at the moment, who knows how things will change. Yeah. Certainly. And that puts a lot of pressure on trainees, you know, when they, the pressure is there that, okay, I need to pass this exam. If I don't pass the exam, my career might finish. That's a lot of pressure. So not only are you dealing with tough exams, you're dealing with the, the, the pressure in your mind as well. And, and I see this day in, day out with trainees and, you know, IMG and non-IMG, you know, for both. The, the other thing which a lot of people ask, you know, they, they, they hear a lot about locum GPs and a lot of locum being available as a GP. So uh, the, what would be your sort of take on working as a locum GP or, uh, versus, a, a, you know, a partnership or a, or a you know, permanent post as a GP? Is there, is there some advice yeah. you can give? Good question. I, I worked in both. So when I first came out of GP training, I did what a lot of GP trainers do, which is I was a locum for a year. So locum GP means you're essentially, you are an independent business and GP practices are going to hire you to come and offer a service to say run a clinic two hours, three hours, this many patients. So you're going in and doing bits of work in different practices. Now there are lots of benefits to this. Number one, you get to experience a lot of different types of practice before you decide what well, this is the type of practice that I want to work in. Number two, you get to experience working in different areas. You can locum one day in London, the next day in Birmingham, for example, if you wanted to. So there's a lot of benefits to being locum GPs. And, and the term that is most commonly termed around now is portfolio general practice. So portfolio general practice means a GP basically who's doing lots of different things. And being a locum GP allows you to have that role more than say if you're a partner. Because if you're a partner, that means you are running a business either yourself or with a group of partners, which is how it normally is. And that leads to a lot of other responsibilities, a lot of other things that you need to be taking care of, building management, leasing staff, employees. Whereas when you're a locum GP, you're essentially just looking after you as a business. So it's a, it's a different frame of mind. There are three main types of GP that people will talk about, locum, salaried, and partnership. So locum is when you're your own independent entity and you work if you want to and you don't work if you don't want to. You have a lot of choice in what you do. Cons to that, some people like routine, some people like structure, some people don't like the fact that they have to go and find their own job. They don't like the uncertainty that I've got nothing booked in three weeks and therefore I'm worried about income from three weeks point of view. So that's your local term practice. Salary general practice is where you're employed by a practice to do a certain number of shifts. So, you, so you're an employee of an organization. So you might be a, a, a force, you know, four day salary GP. So you do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, that's your routine, your schedule is the same every week and you get a salary paid. And the third type is your partnership where you essentially run a practice and you would be employing locums or salary GPs to help manage the clinical workload. So those are the three main um, routes that people often take, but certainly early on, many jump for local general practice for, for those reasons I mentioned. Uh, and I have some personal experience of uh, looking at a life of a GP because my wife is a GP. And yeah, when yeah. I ask her, you know, what is the main advantage? You know, why did you want to go in general practice? And the answer she gave me was that it's because she wanted to be her own boss because she felt that, you know, as working in a hospital, you, whatever level you get to, even if you're considering, you will always have managers and bosses above, above yeah. you for a lot of them. Yeah. But in GP, that independence, you know, she felt that uh, working as a, as a trainer, that, that, that she could be her own boss. You know? Is that something, you know, yeah. that you come across and, or felt? Yeah, definitely, definitely. And there are, there are GP partners who love their job because, yes, they love the clinical stuff, but they love the, 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 the fact they can make decisions. Um, obviously, you have to have agreement with other partners, but generally, you run your organization how you want to run your organization. Um, 
and there are contracts and things, so there are certain things that have to be done, of course, to a certain level. But then you have, apart from that, you have a lot of freedom to decide how you want things to run. And some people thrive on that. Some people run a, run a mile from it. Like they don't want that type of responsibility of managing bills and wages and buildings and staff and leaks and boilers and all those sort of things. So they may prefer the salaried role where you're still within a, you still have a lot of independence. You're, you're an independent GP. You're working, you're making decisions, you're doing what you need to do but you haven't got the other things on your mind that running a business entails. And uh, if an IMG, a junior IMG, if, if they're thinking about uh, exploring GP, because you know one of the problems here in UK is that when we first come in as a junior doctor, we are always working in a hospital specialty, a &E, medicine yeah. and all that. Yeah. Uh, they like to explore GP, but you know they actually haven't really seen what GPs do. Uh, you know, a medical student from UK would have had placements in GP surgery, so they have an idea. Um, so is there any advice for them to sort of try and explore because I did ask sort of I asked them to sort of explore the local surgeries to contact them and see if they will let them sort of come in and uh, sit with some GPs is that something you you, you will advise as well uh, I mean certainly if 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 that's a possibility and you have surgeries in your area you're happy for you to do this then then grab the opportunity I mean no doubt because perceptions are a very powerful thing and a lot of perceptions that I know people have about general practice in, 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 in hospital world is very different to what actually general practice is. So what I say to people who, about this is you, you've got to make your own decision, but you can only make a decision based on what you see. So if local practice are allowing you to do this, then please jump at the opportunity. Sometimes taster weeks are, are there in certain trusts where you can come out of your, your role as it were for a week and go and, you know, go and sit in a general practice. And there might be already a program in there. Some areas do, some areas don't. If there are, grab the opportunity. Um, but also the other caveat to that is if you see one general practice, that's not how all general practices. So for example, every GP practice has its own style of working. So even if you go and see one general practice and it's not quite for you, that doesn't mean that the whole of general practice or every GP works in the same way. So, and that's the, that's the, the, the beauty of it in that every practice is, is individual and, and you're running it how you want to run it. But any opportunity they can grab, I, I would grab it. It might be trust led. It might be that there are things in place already for this, or it might be you have to carve it out yourself. But either way, before you jump into general practice, make sure you're jumping to it with a, with a bit of understanding about what you're doing. Because one thing I often see is that people apply for specialties and they also apply for GP as a, not a backup, but as a kind of, well, if I don't get this, at least I've got GP. Or, you know, GP's three years, let me do at least GP and then I can do more cardiology, for example. So they almost use general practice as a second option. And then they realize when they get into general, or the easier option sometimes, certainly I hear that people say, well, just do GP, it's just three years, get out of the way, at least you get your MRC GP. But actually, it's, it's a tough three years, you know, you're trying to pack in probably what's five, six years worth of experience into three years to start with. Secondly, you only get 18 months usually in a general practice out of that three years, because you're doing hospital rotations as well for at least half of your time. And then suddenly they realize, okay, this is tough. And this is when, if you're not in it for the right reasons, that's when people, I see people struggling in their later years of general practice training. You know, when you didn't really want to do general practice, but you did it because of other reasons, then you can get people struggling with assessments, exams, keeping up to date, because it's a lot to, it's a lot to manage, especially in your third year. Um, and another question which is commonly asked uh, from by IMG is, what is the future of GP uh, outside UK? Because yeah, they say that we, what if after finishing our training, we want to move to Canada, Middle East, you know, Australia, the English speaking world, maybe. Um, yeah. I, I know it's difficult to answer what is it like to go back to Pakistan because, you know, you, you, because we don't have established family medicine, uh, especially for now, you know, it, it might change in, yeah. in the next coming, coming years. Yeah. Uh, but have, have you experienced people going abroad in other countries and sort of making a good life for themselves as well? Yeah. I mean, um, you know, as, as a human race, people are quite adventurous. So they look, they look to see what else is out there. So I see a lot of GPs who finish GP training here. And, you know, if I think about maybe four or five years ago, Australia, New Zealand used to be the big, so a lot of people used to go into Australia, New Zealand, they might do a year there and come back, or they, some of them ended up staying there and, and developing careers there. A couple of years ago, there was a, a lot of people who are moving out to the Middle East to do general practice. It was a, a big drive for primary care in certain uh, countries in the Middle East. And and people were moving out there and again, might have been six months, a year, then come back. Some people stay there, develop connections and build a career in primary care. Back home, India, Pakistan, obviously primary care is there, but it's a lot lower ground level. But, but you know, as time goes on, who knows how that's going to develop? I think there's 
globally there's going to be a need for primary care to take a, a, a bigger role than probably it is. Um, so, and every country obviously has individual rules. So having MRCGP UK allows you to go straight into work as a GP in some countries, but other countries will need still need to go back and do the initial examinations that you do for going to work in any, any part of uh, training in that country. So it, so, it, so it varies. There's an MRCGP International. Some people often ask me about what's the difference between MRCGP UK and MRCGP International. So MRCGP International is a degree that you can do when you're working in other countries. Um, but it doesn't allow you to work as a GP in the UK. Um, and that's often a big question that I get. So some people presume that, okay, I'm working in say Dubai and I wanted, I have, I've completed my MRCGP international. I want to come and work as a UK GP. It doesn't work like that. You still have to go through the GP training UK system. Um, so that often confuses people, but MRCGP UK does allow you to go back to certain countries directly and work as a GP, but not all of them for sure. Uh, thank you, Amanda. This is a very, um, uh very good interview. I think you've given us a lot of tips and a lot of, uh, lot of uh, information. Uh, just a final question, you know, are, are there any tips for IMGs, you know, thinking about general practice or, you know, in general, after thinking about coming to UK as, uh, and sort of thinking about primary care, what would you say to them? Uh, well, firstly, it's not for everybody. I'll, I'll say that straight away. And if you, even the most fanatic GP supporters will turn around and say that GP is not for every style of doctor. You know, some people um, I, I just not, that it's not it's not for them and 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 therefore i would only go into it if you think it's going to suit your style of life number one it's not for everybody um number two there's so much variety in general practice that if you say haven't got a burning passion to be a consultant orthopedic surgeon if you haven't got a 100 percent burning passion then you could probably find that working in gp will suit you because you can do enough of what you enjoy while still being a clinician. Remember in general practice, you see people from cradle to grave, the, the, the term is often used. And I remember in one of my clinics, I'd see a baby who was just born two days ago and the next patient is someone who's 100 years plus. That, that kind of scope of medicine and seeing that age range, but also the depth of the pathology you see, you, you get in very little number of specialities these days with everything being super specialized and super, super neat. So if someone has a general interest in medicine, they have an idea about, okay, I, I don't want my whole life to be medicine. I want to be able to dictate it in certain ways and, and enjoy other aspects of my life. And you haven't got a burning desire to do something that you think you're born to do, then general practice might be a really, really good thing to consider. But I would certainly understand it or take the, the initiative to understand it before you apply. Because it may seem one thing, but then when you get into the reality, it's a different thing. For example, you're, not in, you know, you're, you're in your own room for a clinic. You know, people aren't used to that. People are used to being on ward rounds, working in teams on a ward, seeing patients in unison. That's different to general practice. So this is why things like taste of weeks, going in to see what a general practice works like, is really important for an IMG doctor because um, you really, you're, you're going into a career that might, might be yours for the next 40 years. So you've just got to understand a bit about it before you jump in. But it's a great career, so many advantages, so many benefits. Most doctors in the UK will end up being GPs anyway and you get to see a huge variety of, of pathology, people, um, and you get to be part of their life. Um, you see a story develop from, you see them over years, and you don't get that in many other specialties. Uh, thank you very much, Amun, for your time. And no worries, right? Any, any, anytime, anytime. And just people watching, we have a couple of blogs about getting into GP training, what these exams are all about. And um, so if anybody wants information, just head to our website, auroramedicaleducation.co.uk. Plenty of blogs there for you to have a look at and resources as well. Thank you.